So I wanted to um, mention that the reason that Buzz is up on stage with me is uh, Buzz and I have a project together at American Players Theater. We do interviews with the uh, directors and some of the actors for each of the plays, and they're available as talkbacks to go. They're 14 or 15 minute interviews that you can listen either on the way to the theater or on your way home after seeing a play. And this is our sixth season. I think that's right. Um, yeah. So we're looking forward to going out to APT to do our interviews soon. And when we were talking about the upcoming season, Buzz mentioned that he was going to be here this morning. And I thought it would be a lot more fun to be interviewed by Buzz than to just have me stand up here and nan and on. So thank you, Buzz, for being willing to do that. Oh, you're very welcome. Usually for the APT stuff, Orange conducts the interviews, and I just get to be the engineering geek. So, so now I actually have to ask the questions. But she wrote them out for me. So this is this is going to be this is this is this is not going to be taxing on my brain even at this hour. You can sneak one in if you want. I'm okay, I might, I might, I might, I might, I might ad lib something if yeah. uh, if the opportunity comes up. So, f why did you decide to write a book and tell us about the book? Well, when Orange Tree Imports started, my husband uh, and I bring to the uh, retailing field a degree in uh, German language and Danish literature. Mine being a master's degree, but his is a, a bachelor's degree, but neither of us had ever taken a business course. And, and just out of curiosity, how many of you have a business degree? See, not very many. Uh, many of us get into business through some uh, circuitous manner, and certainly we got into retailing that way. Um, a master's degree in Danish literature does not really prepare you with a lot of life skills. It's a great thing to do, but uh, when I finished my, my degree in Madison, I, I wanted to stay here, and that meant that my only career option was to assassinate my major professor to take his job. So <laughs> I, I thought... That leads to my next question. <laughs> he has passed away, but I had nothing to do with it. Um, but I, I was interested in retailing. When I um, studied at the University of Copenhagen, I spent a lot of time hanging out in, in the uh, shops in Copenhagen. So I approached the owners of Board and Stoll. I don't know if any of you remember Board and Stoll. It was a Scandinavian furniture store in Madison for many years. And uh, I asked if they would hire me because I'd never worked in a retail store. And she said, well, you know, I don't have any openings, but I'd really like to learn Danish. I thought, ha ha, my one life skill. So I, I tutored her in Danish, actually very briefly, when she decided to open a retail uh, branch on Monroe Street. And that actually <clears throat> became the, uh, the first part of Orange Tree Imports, the part with the bay window. So we learned very much by trial and error. Uh, my husband, uh, Dean, joined me a year later after we uh, established it as Orange Tree Imports. And we made mistakes, not that any of you have ever made a business mistake, but uh, we, we made mistakes in our first years and we learned a lot. We uh, were not that interested in being profitable because back in the 70s, capitalism was kind of a, a dirty word until we discovered that you go out of business if you don't make a profit, so that's not a good thing. Um, so when the store was 20 years old, I decided that I would write a book about how to run a store. And that was the first edition of Orange Tree Imports. And, um, this, uh, the new book is the fourth edition. And we should do like they do on TV, age. hold up the book. <laughs> There's the book. Um, so we, we're hearing uh, a lot about what's called the retail apocalypse. What's going on and how scared should we be? <laughs> yeah, it's a really scary term, isn't it? The retail apocalypse, if you're a retailer. Um, the retail apocalypse, I think, is a bit exaggerated. The number of stores that has been closing uh, for last year, for instance, included a lot of Radio Shacks, and they had, you know, thousands of branches. Now we're, we're hearing about Boston Store, of course, uh, some of the big stores that are really in a lot of trouble. It doesn't necessarily translate to the challenges that smaller retail are facing because um, the bigger stores have a lot of debt. They have, you know, had various takeovers at different prices, and they have loans and, you know, um, financing that's quite challenging. They have very expensive leases in many cases in um, shopping centers that might not still be viable. And also they're not flexible. One of the things that's great about being an independent retailer is that you can really change with the times. And um, I recently did an interview with uh, with Joe Vandenplas from In Business and he said, you know, Boston store used to carry this, this brand of jeans that I always bought from them and they don't have them anymore so I don't shop there. And I said, well, if that brand of jeans 
was not selling equally nationally, the Madison store is not going to carry it. And also, I suspect that there's a fair amount of pay to play now in retailing. So if that brand was not making it really advantageous for Boston store to carry it, they were not going to have it in Madison. Those are not factors that, that small retail um, faces. So the retail apocalypse and the number of stores closing really has to do with, in many cases, chain stores and department stores. So as engaged members of our communities and our neighborhoods, why should we care about having a mix of businesses in that community, uh, including shops? Well, I know that a lot of you are not retailers. So um, one of the questions is, why should, you, why should you care about retail? Well, the health of our communities really requires a good mix. Um, there's a national trend towards more uh, restaurants and what Mayor Saga calls poured, poured vegetable, poured, poured vegetable, poured, <laughs> what is it called, poured? I don't know the term. Poured drinks, I mean it, both bars and coffee shops. What am I going for here? Not vegetables, sorry. Um, but um, it, it's all well and good to have a lot of eating establishments, especially because as some of my daughter's young friends said, they, they like to shop online and then go out to eat with their friends. There are also a lot of businesses that you can't do online. I mean, you can't get your hair cut online, you can't exercise online. Um, but when you have a community that is only made up of, of, of bars and coffee shops and restaurants and real estate offices and such, it doesn't have the viability that we want. It's not lively during the day, it's not walkable, it's not social, uh, it doesn't provide the kind of community that the word community really implies. So we need a viable mix in a, in a small town and a larger uh, city like Madison so that it's an attractive place to live and to spend your time. A lot of small towns in Wisconsin are really challenged in terms of retail. And uh, I applaud the fact that Madison has taken a proactive stance towards encouraging retail downtown. Uh, poured beverage, that's what I was looking for, and limiting the licenses uh, and ability for new poured beverages, uh, beverage, poured beverage establishments to open at the expense of retail. Even on Monroe Street, we have uh, over 20 restaurants and, and coffee shops and bars now, which is way more than when I went into business. And it's a fragile tipping point, because if you don't have enough retail, you don't have people coming to shop. We saw that when Walmart started to really suck the life out of small towns, that it wasn't so much that the um, remaining retail stores didn't have something that people wanted, but there weren't enough of them and enough selection for people to make that trip to the downtown instead of going out to the Walmart, Walmart where they could efficiently get their diapers and their lettuce and their prescription all at the same time. So it's, a, it's really important that we have that mix if we want our communities to remain livable and viable. So common wisdom, which is sometimes more common than wise, uh, is that this is all about Amazon. So how big a threat is Amazon to local businesses? You know, I think that Walmart brought many retailers to their knees and, and Amazon has just kind of finished off the job. It's, it's very scary, I think, to see the extent of Amazon's reach. 100 million Amazon Prime members. I mean, that is a large chunk of society. And I have to say that I think Amazon Prime was a brilliant stroke because they, they already had merchandise, they had customers coming, but they realized that with Amazon Prime they could um, eliminate the shipping aspect that is an added cost that, that they would add on in competition with me where someone could just take it with them. But then they also, for example, added um, television shows that people in my demographic wanted to see and could only see if they had Amazon Prime. I mean, they're, they're not dumb, I will say. Uh, and when, when Amazon Prime started, of course, it was only a threat to bookstores. And uh, then when they started getting to pretty much everything else, we realized that Amazon has the ability to um, take a larger and larger market share from, from local retail. So I do think that Amazon is, is a, the giant that we need to really watch out for. It doesn't seem to be going away any, anytime soon. I'm in kind of an odd position because the new edition of my book 
Everyone said, oh, you should just publish it through Amazon. I said, yeah, that, that would be a little hypocritical. <laughs> and and I'm, it is available for sale through Amazon, but I'm encouraging people to buy it from an independent bookstore or to buy it from the publisher or to buy it from me. But, and Sandy might know the statistic, I've read somewhere that 70% of all books are now bought from Amazon. So I'm really having a bit of a challenge getting the word out about the book without sending people to Amazon. So it, it is definitely a threat, but realizing that Amazon is not going away leads us to the question of, okay, how do we exist as retailers in the era of Amazon? Right, which brings us to a little more optimistic question. So getting away from the apocalypse, uh, shopkeepers want to focus on some key strategies to be successful. What would those be? Well, I think that you have to realize that, that this era with Walmart and Amazon is the new normal. So the question is, what can we do well that will bring shoppers to our stores that may not reach the levels that they used to, to be before Amazon or before Walmart, but there's still a reason to exist. Um, when you think about what people want when they go into a store, the primary um, way that you satisfy their needs is through inventory. And this is something uh, that I have taken from my husband, Dean. He said that the ultimate customer service is inventory. You can welcome them warmly. You can ask about their dog. You can give them a cup of coffee. You can make it a, a lovely shopping experience. But if they've come in for a specific item that is what we would call in retailing a bread and butter item, something that they have really good reason to expect you would have, and you don't have it, it's not going to be a satisfactory experience. So having enough inventory, having the right inventory, and having it consistently is very important. Having said that, customer service probably comes next because as we all know as shoppers, it's what's lacking from most of our competitors. If you go into a department store or a discount store, you often can't find anyone around to help you or the um, customer service you get is, is kind of surly or um, it is not customized to your experience. For instance, if you come into Orange Tree Imports and you want something that we don't have in stock, we're willing to at least consider getting it for you. And that's not true of most other places. They might send you to their website, but they're, they're not going to have it for you in, in your store. So the, the idea of providing an enjoyable shopping experience, it's also very important that it's an efficient shopping experience because time is so important to everyone so that you do, they don't want it to take a really long time to check out. They don't want you to have punitive return policies. So it has to be a positive customer experience once they're in the store. And um, I think that that's really a challenge because it's very difficult right now to get retail employees. If anyone is looking for a part-time job, we're hiring. <laughs> um, and we're just not getting applicants. I mean, we used to get 50 or 100 applicants, and uh, it's very hard right now to get people to work retail, and yet that customer service experience depends on, on having a good staff, a well-educated staff, a staff that's enjoying what they're doing. One of the things that I share in the book that I'm particularly proud of, and I've always wondered, if, the book has been translated into Russian, and I wonder what they thought about this part of it, but there's a section on participative democracy. And that is a concept that we learned about from uh, an extension professor um, here in Madison, where you involve your employees in a really high degree in, in your store management. All of our hiring, I must admit we did hire last week without doing this, but all of our hiring is usually done uh, with our staff participating. So they vote on who we hire. We bring the candidates in one by one, in this case more often just one, um, and then they vote on, on whether or not to hire the person. Everyone in our store is in charge of a section of the store, so there's sort of a little entrepreneurship where they have a chance to express their own creativity and have input into what is carried in that area. So those are ways in which we help motivate our staff to be more involved in the business. And we have employees who've been there uh, 30 or more years, so obviously they enjoy the workplace. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is the importance of selling experience. And this is a challenge depending on what you sell, but we all know that, uh, that younger shoppers are looking for experiences rather than, than goods. But that doesn't mean that you can't be selling an experience in a retail store. 
We, for instance, have a cooking school. <clears throat> um, we have contests for, for our um, customers. We have demonstrations. We try and have experiences that are part of retailing, and I think that's really important today. Yeah, I think those, those personal relationships really are important, and if people enjoy going into your shop because the people are so good, the, 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 the customer service is so good, um, that that's I think that's just a huge thing and that that experience is really big so let's talk about Dane by local a little bit what uh, how does the by local movement fit into all this you know I, I often compare the by local movement to the environmental movement you know back when Earth Day was established and we didn't think so much before that about recycling and the importance of um, you know all of the decisions that we make about heating our homes and insulation, you know, the many, many things that go into being good stewards of the planet. Excuse me. And, and that message was really well conveyed through the Earth Day movement and the environmental movement. So that today, it's, it's assumed that you know what recycling is and how to, you know, make wise decisions when you buy an appliance for your home and all those small things that go into being environmentally wise. And I think that the, um, the by local movement is the same concept. We're educating people about why it's important to support local business. And it's not an easy thing to do. Um, we can thank American Express for doing a great job with Small Business Saturday. It's one day of the year, but it has a great deal of name recognition where people now know what a small business is and now think about whether they're supporting small businesses, especially on that particular day. Um, many years ago, one of my fellow businesses on Monroe Street said that she didn't want to participate in Small Business Saturday because it seemed like it was a promotion for American Express. And I said, well, they're not a nonprofit. They wanted to get people to stop using their American Express card just to buy airline tickets. They wanted them to start using them in smaller businesses. And uh, they saw this as an opportunity, but I applaud the fact that they have continues, continued to do that. They now <clears throat> work with some other partners, but it's been a great way of getting the Buy Local message out. But Dane Buy Local has the um, unique distinction of being one of the largest Buy Locals in the country. There are still many communities that don't have a Buy Local organization. And um, I think it's so important that we work together. Certainly Monroe Street is much stronger because the merchants work together. And um, for small businesses around the country to each in their community, and it needs to be community-based community because it's local, by local, <clears throat> for each of those communities to have an organization that helps get the word out to consumers about shopping local uh, and why it's important. But it also has to be couched in such a way that people realize that we're not saying, oh, you're a bad person if you don't buy everything locally or use only local resources. Um, I'm always a little bit um, nervous when I end up in a big box store to get something because I think, oh, people are going to look at me and go, ha ha, she doesn't buy locally. But there are certain items you can't buy from a locally owned business. So, you know, we all have to make choices. We all have to... Um, you know, go where, where we need to, to go to, to find something. And also, in my case, it's really important that I know what the other stores are carrying because we try and distinguish ourselves with our inventory and have things that big stores don't have. Well, I can't do that if I never go into Target or never <clears throat> visit Amazon's website. I have to know what the competition is doing. But the buy local movement, I think, is the most promising aspect for all of us um, in supporting each other and getting consumers to support us. Great, and uh, what's new in the fourth edition of the book? Wait, we're just flying through these questions. Yeah, I know, I don't know, how are we doing on time, by the well, way? We've got plenty of time. Okay, yeah. great, then, we'll all right. talk very slowly. We can follow you. <laughs> um, the last edition of the book came out in 2007. That was the third edition. Oddly enough, there wasn't a second edition. There was a first edition, and then there was the expanded, revised edition but they didn't say that I couldn't call it the second edition. And then there was a third edition. Um, but the fourth edition, I, I started working on it a couple of years ago because I really felt that it was time to update the information. And it's the, the first three editions sold over 40,000 copies, so it's one of the you know more successful books on, on small retail. And it's been really exciting for me to hear from people all over that have found the book helpful. 
But what I discovered when I started working on the fourth edition is that both retailing and publishing have gone through enormous changes. And John Wiley and Sons basically said, how many different ways can we tell you no, we do not wish to do a fourth edition? Um, and there are very few new books out on retailing. It's not just that, that they didn't want to publish mine. There are hardly any out there. And retailing, as we've already mentioned, has gone through a lot of change also. So it was a real challenge to find a publisher without going to Amazon to self-publish. Um, I ended up using a, a local publisher in Milwaukee, Henschel House, and that has been a, a positive experience, except for the marketing aspect, which has been a, a challenge. For one thing, 10 years ago, there were still um, more national bookstores. I mean, there were Borders, I think, was still around 10 years ago and the way that people found books was different. But when I went to look um, at what, what had changed in 10 years, there's a book called Thank You For Being Late that talks about how things changed in, in about the year 2007 when my last edition came out. And the first thing that they mentioned is social media. And sure enough, I looked in the index of the third edition under Facebook and it's not there. I do talk in the last edition about selling online and having a website, so that part of it did exist 10 years ago. But social media, Instagram, Pinterest, um, Twitter, Facebook, all of that pretty much was getting its start 10 years ago in the time that uh, Thank You For Being Late was written. So that's a, a new way for us to stay in contact with our customers and have relationships with our customers that I think is quite exciting. Um, it's um, it's not a cure-all. As we all know, there's this myth that if people like something on Facebook, they're going to rush in and buy it. And unfortunately, that's not exactly true. Uh, the other change that he talked about in that book was the um, proliferation of smartphones. When you think about what your iPhone uh, is, it's basically having a computer in your pocket. And that was not the case 10 years ago. So the relationship that people growing up um, since that has happened is that that's an extension of their lives. You know, they have their phones with them all the time and they are on their phones um, quite frequently. They shop on their phones. So that's a new challenge for us. How do we both make use of that technology, which I talk about in the book, but also how do we get them away from that technology to actually come into the store and shop? So I would say that, that those are, are some of the big challenges. Um, and, and the book is actually longer. I thought, seriously, <laughs> we, took the, um, we took the glossary and, and put it online to make the book shorter, but it's still 450 pages. Um, because I really wanted to cover everything that someone needed to know, um, both, who is, both someone starting a store and also someone in business. That, I would say, is one of the other main differences. Even though the book was always intended for both existing retailers and people starting out, my daughter pointed out that the way it was laid out before was sort of, here's what you do to start your store, and then it, it goes through that, and it gives tips along the way if you've already got a store. So I rearranged it, because frankly, there are not very many people starting a store. I mean, Refined on Monroe Street is one of the new retail businesses, but there are not dozens of them, in part because it is so incredibly difficult to get financing. If you want to start a store like my store and get a bank loan for um, the inventory and sign a lease for who knows how much per you know per year it's a real challenge financially so i what one of my goals is to help people who are already in retail to be more successful and to um, deal with the, the current retail environment so the book is specialty shop retailing how you can succeed in today's market the fourth edition uh buy it at orange tree if you can or here. buy it on or here <laughs> Uh, buy it on Amazon if you have to, and uh, and uh, I, I just uh, I, I, if we got more time, I can open it up for questions. But I want to just say a couple of things that I can say, but Orange really can't, which is that um, in addition to the American Players Theater, I mean, she really lives this buy local thing. Um, it seems like every time I'm a recording engineer, I work with music groups. I, you know, I work with theatrical groups. It seems like almost everything I'm involved in, Orange and Dean, her husband, are are also involved in some way, giving time, giving money, you know, whatever. So, um, your involvement really makes this a, a better place to live, and I thank you for that. That's so sweet. Thank you so much.
Do, do any of you have questions for her? I did want to just quickly mention that there's also a blog. I write a, a weekly blog that is not really limited to retailers, so it's uh, specialtyshopretailing.com, and it has a lot of small business advice. Um, you're welcome to sign up to get it sent to you each week or just to check it out. Um, I've written over 400 blogs, blog posts, which is an awful lot. Sometimes it's a little hard to come up with a topic. I get the newsletter, it's every Monday morning that it pops in my email. It, it's very informative and I find things in there all the time well, that are you. very valuable. So, but I have a question about uh, baby boomers. Um, you know, a number of baby boomers, even here in Madison, own stores and now they're getting to the point of what are they gonna do with their business? Any observations? On so that? I don't know. If, did you all hear that question? Okay, about baby boomers and their businesses. Okay. Well, I, one thing I didn't mention in terms of the challenges we're facing is the change in demographics about baby boomers' shopping habits. If you are a baby boomer business owner, then you are most likely to have customers. You know, your core customers might be close to your own age, and people my age are not buying as much, and they um, are downsizing and that kind of thing. So that's a challenge. Also, the other demographic change is that younger shoppers are not buying as much because they're not buying uh, material goods in the same way. You know, they're not collecting. They're not um, building out homes with a lot of stuff, which in, in many ways is a good thing, but it's a challenge if you're trying to sell stuff. <laughs> um, you know, the, the succession plan for retail is really, really difficult. It's hard to sell a business as a going business in part because uh, if someone wants to open a store, it's um, perhaps more um, economically viable for them to just rent a space and buy all new merchandise instead of buying your merchandise, unless you've been in business a long time and have a lot of name recognition. Um, so you, in many cases, would make more money going out of business than you would trying to sell it as a going business. People often ask me what Orange Tree Imports succession plan is, and frankly, it, it is, it's a very tough topic. I mean, I'm, uh, my mother and my grandmother both worked until they were, were 80, so I hope I have some years left in me and don't have to face that question. But, you know, both of my kids have made their own lives, and, you know, would they come back to take over the store? I don't know. So, yeah, there's a big change coming up. I, I hear that from my sales reps, that they call on stores where the owners are retiring or are trying to sell the business unsuccessfully. And um, a lot of younger retailers who open stores are using what I would call the concept store idea where they have a mix of merchandise, you know, some candles, some clothing, some picture frames, some soaps, all, you know, with a similar look, but a very low amount of inventory. And I'm not sure in the long run if that's really going to work for them. Um, so yeah, that, that's de the change in demographics is a big issue for retail. Anyone else? Yes. Mark, just because we're in the same thing doesn't, and we're talking about this change, do you see that there's anything that local government can do? Uh, I know we have a very active local government and that they have to decide grants for people. And a couple years ago, I think they ran out of money. They even did grants to retailers downtown that, that wanted to remodel their space. But are there ways that we can look to our local government to try to encourage retailing and try to encourage people going into it, what kind of things they do? So Sandy's asking about how government can encourage retail, and I think that um, I admire the fact that Madison has these matching grants for um, downtown retail to remodel. That's very unusual, and it's, it's a little bit tricky because it has to be leasehold improvements that can't, if I'm not mistaken, it, it can't include actual fixtures or inventory. But certainly financing, I mean, that's the biggest thing. Or putting a, a, making it difficult for non-retail to go in with the poor beverage uh, regulation so that you're encouraging retail by making it difficult for non-retail to take over a space. But I think that financing is probably the biggest thing. When we think about the SBA loans, which um, we certainly used when we started Orange Tree Imports, the bank across the street from us, which was at that point down the street from us, uh, was able to give us a loan that was guaranteed by the SBA to start our store and get us some inventory. And that program, I think, got a lot of people started and maybe there needs to be a revision of that program, maybe higher amounts of money, um, 
encouraging, I mean, the banks have been through a tough time, so I'm not sure whether it's the bank's difficult times or maybe the SBA doesn't have as much money as it used to. Um, and in our case, next week, they're tearing down the bank across the street from us, so it's sort of the end of an era. Um, but the new building that's going in, like many new developments, is going to have apartments and then retail on the main floor. So one question is, how do we encourage that to actually be retail with all these apart uh, buildings going up? Certainly downtown, what we're seeing is that almost all of the retail on the main floor is, is restaurants and bars. Yeah, I've talked to people who are, are talking about you know starting a business and they say what's the what's the best advice you can give and I sometimes half jokingly say the best thing you can do is develop a friendship with a banker because <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna need that uh, a lot as you uh, build and grow any other questions for orange yes well, I think you're just kind of a legend in the community so thank you <laughs> um, but I would love she's a legend to, I'd love to hear you just speak on competition um, I hear a lot about you know community over competition, and I love that mentality. But at the end of the day, you can't help but when you hear of something new coming um, in that may hurt your business. How do you how do you mentally think about competition, or even when you go into the big box stores to see what they have? I find I often put my blinders on, and I prefer to keep my head down to stay true, to be authentic to who we are. But it is important to keep your eyes open and look up. Um, but can you just speak to that? Yeah, did, did everyone hear the, the question? How do you, you know, how do you, how do you sort of keep your attitude uh, uh, positive when you're dealing with, uh, you know, competitors and, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, just, just, you know, staying a positive force? Well, I don't view any of my fellow small business people as competitors. Um, when I started the Monroe Street Merchants Association, there was definitely a feeling, and that was uh, over 40 years ago, that people didn't want to know each other because they um, they viewed each other as competitors, and they didn't you know, want to share any trade secrets. Well, believe me, if you write a book about everything you know and your neighbors read it, there's no, there's no secrets. <laughs> um, so the more people we bring to Monroe Street, the better. I mean, certainly, the success of my fellow businesses helps my success, and that's definitely something I believe. But um, it is hard, you know, when you have people you know say, oh yeah, I got that on Amazon, or, you know, I'm, I'm going to serve the tabla and they've got this great such and such, without even thinking about the fact that that might kind of hurt my feelings. Um, but the other question that you bring up that I think is really important is the question of a positive attitude. It's tough when things are challenging, when you realize that your sales are not going to be what they once were, to still remain positive. And um, certainly we have our days when things are, are very difficult. Last week we had a two, three days where the basement flooded with mud because of the construction on Monroe Street. Um, we were actually out of town and I haven't been to the store yet to see it, but I've seen pictures and it was not pretty. So an upbeat attitude is really important because that's part of the customer service we offer. You know, people walk in and they want to smile and they want it to be a positive experience. And so um, we just have to think, how do we get our share of what's out there? And um, I know there are business areas where they're, they try really hard not to carry the same merchandise. And I used to be a little bit more hung up on that than I am now, maybe because there aren't that many retail stores. But I do think that as long as we present what we have in the best possible way, and we try and be competitive on prices, um, which is sometimes surprises people that we're not more expensive than, than other places, um, that we do our best and try and engage our customers and, and make it rewarding for them to come back. <laughs>